I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. When we want to know who Jesus is, we have a lot of places that we can look. Oftentimes for us as Christian people, the place we will start is Jesus' life itself, which we have come to know best in four Gospels. But those are not the only place where we will hear something about who Jesus is, how we have come to understand him, and, and how we know him to be revealed. We have other places in Scripture. We have the letters of the early church. We have the Acts of the Apostles to see how these first disciples talked about Jesus to a world who was hungry to hear it. And even in our lives here and now in this place, we see it on the faces of one another. We see it in bread broken, in sacramental moments, that all of those things tell us something about who Jesus is. And in this time, in this expectant and wondrous season, there is another place that we hear all about who Jesus is and who he will be, and that is in the prophets. They are such a gift to the church and such an important part of what we hear and what we identify with in this season of Advent. This year in particular, we will hear lots from Isaiah like we did this morning of a peaceable kingdom, of a place where predator and prey take on new meaning, all because of the one who is coming, the one who is coming to usher in a new, peaceable, merciful kingdom here on earth. There are also loads of other things that we have come to identify with Jesus, like that great word, that great hopeful word out of Micah, for tiny little Bethlehem, out of you comes something and someone from of old to give hope to Israel in how he rules over them. Not every word is that positive, though. Not everyone fills us with great hope. There is also some heeding of warning here. Again, we'll return to Isaiah in the weeks to come, and at one point we'll hear that, yes, this Lord is holy, and he will be like a stone that causes some to stumble. All of this shows us a multi-layered picture of who Jesus is and, and who he will be. And it's in the spirit of that last example that we meet a new character today. A new character like one of the Old Testament prophets himself. Of course, this is John the Baptist. And he plays the part well, don't you think? He has the wardrobe. He has the diet. He has the setting. And there are lots of things he does not share with his predecessors, too. Like the prophets of old, not quite, sometimes. So, for example, he's not speaking to all of God's people in one moment like God's prophets often did. He'll speak to those who come to him and his little band of disciples as well. At least when we are introduced to him, he is not screaming at the power of the day or to some king. He will, but that bit will come later. Or he's not found in the midst of a great city and a huge population. Instead, he is in a wild place, a new and different place, found in the wilderness, also portraying one of his predecessors. But instead of talking about past behavior or the ways that Israel has gone wrong, his focus is different. He is looking ahead. He is looking for the one who is to come. And he does so almost with danger in his voice, don't you think? with danger and a great desperation for the one who is coming, with power and fire and spirit, you can tell he is serious. You can tell that he wants to be taken seriously and that that is how we have to hear him this day. John's words are essential to knowing something about Jesus as the one who is coming. Are they not? In a way, they matter because of who he is. He is the last in a long line of those who have come before him, a species that is about to go extinct, if you will. There have been so many heralds of this kingdom to come, and yet when it is this close, 
when the kingdom is here and drawing close to us, there may be no longer any need for such heraldry. The time is now. The time is coming, he will tell us. We have to take those words seriously. We have to see this bit of unquenchable fire, this bit about the axe lying at the root of the tree, all of this about the winnowing fork. These are important words we hear this day. It's almost now or never for John. The hour is coming and now is, if you will. And with all of that said, we have to return to where we started, that we have a multi-layered view of Jesus. And, especially in this church, in the Episcopal Church and in this place, we have come with a healthy respect and a healthy faithfulness to say, it is okay for us to ask questions of our scriptures. In fact, it is encouraged. In sermons and book groups and Bible studies and whatever you'd like to say, we have found that to be a faithful practice in this place. My favorite question of this story comes from an old homiletics professor in seminary, a wily old veteran who has probably taught classes for 30 years and, and preached 30 sermons about John the Baptist and his axe and the winnowing fork and all that. And almost as an aside, he uttered to a group of us as students when we were reading this passage for this day, has it ever occurred to any of us that John the Baptist might be wrong? Axes lying at the bottom of the tree, unquenchable fire, winnowing forks. It's a picture of Jesus. Maybe. It can be. But I'm not sure it tells the whole story. I'm not sure it tells the whole story of the one who is to come. Because we do have the benefit of knowing more of this story. We do have the benefit of gospels and letters and people who know that the one who is coming is also coming with grace and truth. The one who is coming is also coming with mercy and compassion and understanding. The one who is coming comes as love. It is a great multi-faceted, multi-layer of Jesus, the Christ who is coming, that we must listen to. And at the same time, that might be why John's words are still so important to us this day. Why they do matter. If anything John teaches us this day, he teaches us to take this coming seriously, with great care, knowing that Advent is a serious time. We ought to look for Jesus' coming seriously. But whether or not it is with unquenchable fire, and whether or not it is with axes and winnowing forks, we also know this Jesus to be the one who seemingly had more interest coming to us vulnerably as an infant with no powers whatsoever. We know this Jesus who will come to us not taking on great conquest, but self-emptying through ministry and healing and life and his passion. We also know this Jesus who is to come to take on all the power that we will give him, but by doing it by seeking a greater glory only known through the power and scandal of the cross. We have a multi-layered view of this Jesus, the one who is coming with power and spirit and fire. This gives us an opportunity as we process through this expectant, wondrous, urgent even, time together. That by the time the Holy Family make their way up our gorgeous windows and into this nativity set, we might do well to consider two questions that we learn from John and we learn from the one to come. And those are these. That as we wait, as we expect the coming of Christ, we must do well to hear the prophets, and especially this day remember John and ask, what is it in this time, as we prepare for Jesus to come, that we might need to take more seriously in our lives, in our relationships, in our expectations? And with that, 
what are also the things we might need to approach with more grace, like the one who is coming in our lives, in our relationships, in our discipleship, with ourselves. The prophets are a great gift to this season and to us who wait patiently and urgently for this Jesus to come. What might we need to take more seriously because of their words? And how can we expect the coming of Jesus with grace and truth even now?